Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. It's Chris Nichols here. And it's Jordan. Yeah, I'll introduce you in a bit. And uh, today we're going to be doing another one of our series where we talk about brands, what we think they can improve, what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. Today we're talking about Canon. And, you know, doing the research, honestly, I just feel like Canon's come so far. I really love the R5 platform. I think it's a near-perfect camera. So I don't have a lot to complain about. So I'm going to be good cop Chris today. And uh, beside me here is going to be No Joy Jordan, my... Uh, my Sultan of Sadness, my human Eeyore. Okay, I think that's probably good. No, 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 um, no, no. So I, I got more, hang on one sec. Uh, my Glum Chum, my uh, uh, Sir Cries A Lot, the Killjoy of Cameras. I'm Jordan Drake. Yes, the famous director of that 70s hit horror film, The Whining. I am Jordan Drake of DP Review TV. DepressingPhotographyReviews.com. So the first topic we're going to discuss is autofocus. Canon has made huge strides here, lots of firmware updates, and they've really improved their game. So Canon's autofocus, one of their standouts, probably the best in the industry is their animal detect autofocus. Yeah. Works great for birds, wildlife, many different kinds of animals, pets obviously, and uh, even works with the slow telephotos like the F11s very effectively. Yeah, and it's great, but the problem is we've just found more inconsistent results when we're shooting not animals. You know, mm -hmm. you photograph more people and there we're finding quite a few more inconsistencies and you absolutely have to use the different case modes and tell it like, you know, how fast the subject's gonna be accelerating, decelerating, how long to stay on the specific subject. Some people like that, having that creative control, but yeah, it's nice to have professionals that are willing to put in the time. Totally, but if you look at, say, Sony's real-time tracking, Nikon's 3D tracking, I find even if you don't play with any of those settings, it's just a more consistent experience. So I think mm -hmm. Canon just needs to iron out how intelligently it'll work. Yes, but they still have eye control autofocus, which is really, so intuitive, it's innovative, and I just find that it's the most natural way of making things focus. I would love to give an opinion on the eye yeah. control autofocus, but it doesn't work for me. Just like I would say nearly half of the people we've given the camera to, they're having trouble calibrating it, it's inconsistent. So True. yes, if it works for you, that's great. My half, love it. All right, Chris, let's talk about lenses, an area where I definitely think there's some room for improvement. I mean, Canon have a really extensive line of lenses now for the RF mount. I mean, I like the fact that they've got their fast pro zooms, but also their F4 zooms are more affordable, more compact. Um, they've actually done a pretty good job of fleshing out their primes. I do wish that we had a 24 and 28, you know, 1.8, some sort of cheaper, faster primes. But to their credit, they've got a beautiful 100mm macro lens, and they've also put great macro capabilities into their 35 and their 85. Right. So they kind of pull double duty. So really, what are they lacking, Jordan? Well, I mean, they came out right off the start with a bunch of lenses that were unlike anything you could get anywhere else, yeah. right? Like the 28 to 70 f2 lens was a real standout. That 100mm macro you mentioned, where you can you know, adjust the style of bokeh that sure. you're getting on it. Really cool stuff like that. But lately, I just feel like there haven't been that many compelling designs. And where I really think they need to work on is the telephoto end. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do have some zoom lenses that are a little bit slower, unfortunately. Uh, their super telephotos are very expensive, and it looks like they just slapped an EF adapter on the back of them. <laughs> Permanently. Yeah, I'd like to see more original mirrorless specific designs. When you see something like Nikon's new 800mm 6.3, you're like, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I would love to see from Canon. So I want more of that. It's just been a while since we've seen some really cool, this is why you buy mirrorless, is for amazing lens designs like this. So the next thing we're talking about is image quality. Again, this is something I think Canon's come a long way in recent years, especially with cameras like the R5, but what do you think, my maestro of misery? They certainly have really nice images, but mostly when you're talking about their improvements in image quality, you're talking about the R5, which is one camera in their lineup right Granted. now. And we are starting to see this really irritating habit where we're getting baked in noise reduction in the raw files Okay, there. but yes, and let me cut you off right there because yeah, baked in noise reduction, we're seeing it more and more though. And I mean, it does give excellent high ISO performance but, and the detail loss is minimal. I get that it's the principle of yeah, the matter. Exactly. You know, having full control over your raws, I totally get that. I don't want to take that away from anybody, but in the long run, I think you're still going to get great images out of it. Most people won't even well, notice. Okay, but here's something you can't dispute. Like we can see the way that cameras are moving towards like these super fast readouts out, mm -hmm. even shutterless cameras in the future. And I was really happy to see the R3, you know, they skipped doing backside illuminated sensors, went straight to like a stacked sensor there. They're producing them, that's great. But of the flagships, like sports cameras, mm -hmm. it's the lowest resolution and the slowest readout on those. So I'm a little concerned when they do eventually bring out the high res stacked sensor camera that they're gonna have to bring to market. What are the readout rates gonna be like on that? Well, now I'm sad. That's what I do. Now another pain in the ass with Canon is that 
their battery life hasn't been tremendous and they're not bringing out any new super efficient battery types. I mean, like, let's look at the R5 that you keep bringing up. I think it's an incredibly well-rounded camera, but the one strike against it is the battery life is not great. And I use one all the time. I struggle with that constantly. Okay, sure. But when you look at the US R3, their flagship cameras, the SEPA rating is better than what the Sony A1 can perform and actually basically on par with the Nikon Z9. And we were very happy with battery life on that. Yeah. You could shoot photography all day on a yeah, Canon US again, R3. You're talking about SEPA ratings there. Real world, when we were shooting, we found we burned through the R3 batteries a lot quicker, especially if you're going to be shooting video, right. uh, where the Z9 just goes from, I mean, it's filming us right now, and we've been at this for about 10 hours now. God, you really are the democratically elected leader of despondency. So the next thing we're going to talk about is interface, because the camera should not only take great photos and videos, but also be easy to use, simple to understand. Canon have an awesome interface. I don't even think Saddam Sadler over there could complain about it. Saddam Sandler? Yeah, you know, you made uh, Billy Sadison and Big Saddy. Those were really nice, uh, uplifting crowd pleasers. I think a lot of people enjoyed it. So anyways, um, interface. I don't see how you could dispute this. I mean, first off, their touchscreen interface, it's always available. It doesn't cut out in certain modes. I love that if you're doing selfie stuff, shooting yourself, you can still use the touchscreen interface with the screen flipped. Um, but it's really more than that. You know, of all the systems, although they've all improved, I think anybody who's unfamiliar with the camera can come into a Canon and it makes sense right, right off the bat. Visually, things make sense. Um, you know, if you think, oh, if I touch this, it should go here. Yes, it does. Uh, you know, it's a great menu interface, easy to see, and they've really stuck to at the same time, a menu system for a long amount of years that people recognize if they right. are coming from a Canon system. So it's beautiful. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love it for photography, but again, I'm gonna wet blanket. If you're a video shooter, then there are some real compromises, like on their full frame cameras, if you start recording, you lose your histogram, you lose your level. And I've been harping on and on about this, and then they brought out the R5C, which is like their hybrid I gave camera. You all that. I really like that you have the best two interfaces in that. If you use the R5C and shoot photos, it uses their great consumer photo interface, yes. and then their cinema interface when you're rolling video. Sounds like you love the Canon interface. I, I do in that particular camera, but what I don't think we're gonna see is them roll that video interface into their other other consumer cameras. Okay, so. but yes, that's that's just market segmentation. That's a Canon tradition as well. Kind they're of just, annoying. They're just sticking to their guns. Okay, so don't have the full interface. Just give me like a waveform or a way to meter while I'm rolling. That would be great, Canon. Okay, Chris, last topic, and I would love to see you defend Canon on this. Uh, their product lineup is an absolute mess. Okay, so the problem isn't that bad at the top end. Like you go R6, R5, Great cameras. Yep. R5C, R3, everything makes sense. Sure. There. My only concern is like the R3 is already more expensive than like a flagship camera from another manufacturer. How much is their future? I don't know, R1, the flagship mirrorless camera, yeah. gonna wind up cost. That's a tough one, right? The R1, it's not gonna be able to compete with the A1 and the Z9. It's gonna have to stand head and shoulders above it really to justify its price tag. We're gonna have to see what that's gonna be like. But I mean, you know, otherwise their cameras are pretty good. No, no, no. So if you look down lower, that's where I have the real problems with the lineup because you've got two pretty underwhelming full frame cameras, sure. the R and the RP at the bottom of their RF mount. Uh, but if you want to go even lower than that, then it's like, okay, you've got the M mount, which has had nothing come out for it in a long time. So that could be dying at any point. Or EF mount, which is a mount we already know is dead, their DSLR thing. So like, do you choose the mount that's dying, the one that's okay. dead, or do so you yes. go to another brand that seems to have some sort of idea of what they're doing? So clearly going forward, what Canon has to do is come out with a new revamped entry-level full-frame yes. camera. Replace both the R and the RP, make something that competes very favorably with the Nikon Z5, the Sony A7C. I think that would be fantastic. Totally. And then the next thing you have to do, and you know, this isn't just a Canon thing. You have to admit, this is a Sony thing, this is a Nikon thing. Yeah. Figure out what you're going to do with your APS-C line of, uh, of cameras. You know, I mean, the M6 Mark II is a great little platform, but I don't think anybody's looking at it. So going forward, they have to figure out that issue. They have to give clear direction on what they're going to do, but that's everybody. We just want answers, Canon. I still think Canon's made a lot of improvements in the last couple yes. of years, but clearly there's still room for improvement, and hopefully we shed light on that today. Uh, I know none of you out there have any strong opinions about Canon, no. so, uh, but if you happen to, leave those in the comments below. We'd love to see that, but otherwise... Thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm Chris Nichols. This is my co-host, uh, Pessimist Prime. Stop knocking this off. The, the, you're the leader of these robots that I'm transform. Out. Out. No. You turn into a vehicle which is Do necessary for shipping goods and services. I, I uh, don't think he's 
coming back anytime soon. But you know, hey, if you like and subscribe to the channel, that'll really cheer up Jordan. Let's do that for him. I think he's a little bit sad for some reason. But otherwise, as always, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you soon for another episode of Deep Review TV.